Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. How would you summarize Christianity in one word if you had to? What word perhaps could encapsulate the ethos, the character or the disposition of every Christian, of the Christian community? I'm sure it would be difficult to try to encapsulate all of it into one word, and it would be hard, you'd be hard pressed to argue one word or another. Perhaps you could use truth, or you could use the word love. After all, that is also what Jesus said, you, the world will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another, or perhaps kindness. But I would contend that today, uh, at least as we're looking at grace, that perhaps grace is a good candidate for such one word summary of our faith as Christians. One that sets our faith apart from many other world religions is this wonderful concept of God's grace. While in other religions, as you perhaps know, people have to earn their favor with God. They have to pay for their salvation in some way or another, their forgiveness. But one of the fundamental truths of Christianity, I'm sure you're not new to this, is that God loves us despite our sin and our rebellion. That's his grace. He is sympathetic with our weakness. And he made the greatest sacrifice to reconcile us to himself, even though we didn't deserve it. He chose not to count our sins against us and instead to freely give us eternal life, to give us the perfect righteousness of his, of his son. That is grace. Uh, one well-known acronym for grace of G-R-A-C-E is God's riches at Christ's expense. And the Bible tells us that God displayed his grace in that way that he did to us Verse, uh, Ephesians 2, 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace. In other words, Christians, you and me, are objects of God's grace put on display for the rest of the world because we're the ones that have received his grace. So when the world searches for grace, they should be able to look at you or me or our community as a fellowship of Christians. But why is it that the church is sometimes the last place for the world to find grace on display? Philip Yancey, in a book entitled, What's So Amazing About Grace? He writes about his own journey of faith and his search for grace. And he writes on page 16, I rejected the church for a time because I found so little grace there. Unfortunately, what the church often displays is what Yancey terms ungrace. He says, grace is Christianity's best gift to the world, a spiritual nova in our midst, exerting a force stronger than vengeance, stronger than racism, stronger than hate. And sadly, to a world desperate for this grace, the church sometimes presents a form of ungrace. Now, if we are to be the world, if we are to be to the world around us, an exhibition of God's grace, I think we need to simply heighten our awareness of God's grace upon our lives and also deepen our appreciation for his grace because it isn't it doesn't just take well I'll just try harder to be more gracious I think if we truly dwell on the grace of God poured out for us to truly heighten our awareness and deepen our appreciation of it then we begin to be more gracious people Yancey's good book is a good way to to heighten our awareness it's, it's also, but so is a study of the book of Romans, which we've been doing since last March. Because Yancey, in his opening acknowledgments, says, I should also thank the Apostle Paul, who in his magnificent letter to the Romans, taught me everything I know about grace. That's why we've been studying the book of Romans. I hope as well that the result of it will mean that we truly appreciate God's grace upon our lives, as much as the book of Romans is such a wonderfully theological book about our faith. And then while Yancey um, had rejected the church for a time because I found so little grace there, he also writes, I returned, meaning I returned to the church because I found grace nowhere else. And so I also hope that through our study of Romans, especially where we are now in chapter 5, the verses we're going to look at today, that we as a church, as a community of Christians, that we are a people who are aware of, and appreciate deeply God's grace so that we become a place that the world will see grace, the grace they long for, 
on display in living vivid color. So today we're going to review, first of all, where we've just come from, because now it's a new year. The last time we were in, in Romans was back in November. So we're going to review quickly where we've come from in these first five chapters of Romans and then and focus our attention on the last few verses of chapter five, which brings to us this glorious conclusion about God's grace that has abounded to us, which now, as Paul says, now reigns in us. And like I did when we were last in Romans, I also want to talk about five ways that God's grace can be displayed in your life and mine. Now, as I said, just knowing these five areas, and there's certainly going to be more than five ways that God's grace is displayed, just knowing them doesn't make us more gracious people. Hopefully, as a result of today's worship service and message today, that we'll be more aware of God's grace in our lives. We'll appreciate the ways that God has shown us his grace. And that awareness and appreciation, I believe, is so transforming to our behavior that we will inevitably display that grace towards others. So let's follow along as Paul extols the grace of God and let's consider these five ways that his grace can be displayed in us. In chapter one, Paul made the point that all mankind is under the wrath of God. All mankind collectively had rejected and suppressed the truth of who God is, specifically his eternal power and his divine nature, which is fully displayed in creation. Man is without excuse, he said in chapter one. And then he went on to chapter two, where he concluded that therefore all of us, all of mankind descended from Adam are all under con condemnation. We will each be rendered judgment according to our guilt. Now, Paul's audience happened to be among uh, both Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Greeks, as he says, and so he also demonstrates then that just because the Jews have the law and they've been circumcised as a uh, symbol of the covenant that God made with Abraham, they don't have any leg up. They don't have an advantage in terms of righteousness because no one is made righteous by the law. That was chapter three. And then chapter four then was all about how faith in God can be counted as righteousness. Look at Abraham's faith. Paul said in chapter 4, when God made a promise to him, Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham's faith was not earned, but it was credited to his account. Abraham believed God and his promise. And then Paul makes Abraham's faith relevant to us, that his faith was counted as righteousness to him. And then for us, that by the grace of God, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who was raised from the dead, is also counted as righteousness to us. Because we believe, as Abraham believed God, we believe God's promise. We believe that Christ was the Son of God, delivered up to die on the cross, and therefore our trespasses uh, were, were forgiven, and Christ was raised for our justification. So now we finally reach chapter 5, after that quick review. And in chapter 5, Paul begins and opens the book or the, the chapter with, We have peace with God. We have access to grace, and we have the hope of the glory of God, which gives us reason to rejoice. The rest of chapter 5 explains how he can make such a confident claim that you and I can have peace with God, that you and I can be reconciled to God. How can he make that claim? In Romans chapter 5, verse 5, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God loved us and he continues to love us. How can we be so sure? Because Christ died for us, not when we were righteous, but while we were still sinners, while we were still ungodly, while we were still enemies of God and still deserving of his wrath. And instead of God's wrath and instead of death, God made us righteous, reconciled us to him and freely gives us eternal life. Friends, that is the amazing grace that we need to be dwelling on day in and day out. That is the truth in a nutshell of God's amazing and abounding grace on display that instead of wrath and death, which we did deserve, you and I received eternal life, which we didn't deserve. And then as we get to the end of chapter five, Paul is explaining how God can just count our faith in Christ as righteousness. Because normally that's not the way it is. Normally injustice is you get condemned because you're guilty and that's it. How can God simply count 
Christ's righteousness to our account? Well, he goes on to explain about Adam and the difference between Adam and Christ. Adam disobeyed God because he sinned, and therefore death entered the entire human race through sin. But Christ obeyed his Father, and because he was righteous, all who believe in him can have eternal life. That's where we left off in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 15, where we saw how different Adam's trespass was from Christ's obedience. Yes, they all affected everyone else, or the, the, the one act affected everyone else. That's the similarity. But Christ's obedience was much greater because Christ's obedience actually regenerates. It gives new life. It reconciles us to God. It brings peace, and it gives us access to grace. So as we now turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 17, or 18 to 21. You can turn in your Bibles there with me if you wish. We're going to see Paul describing how the, um, the act of Adam and the act of Christ are in fact very similar in that a single act by the one person affects the many, not just the one who committed the act. And as we read this, notice how one trespass leads to the condemnation for all, and one man's disobedience, many are made sinners, and the result being that sin reigned in death. But then when he looks at Christ, one act of righteousness leads to justification and to life of for all. And by one man's obedience, many are made righteous. And what is the result of that righteousness? That grace reigns and leads us to eternal life. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So even though sin may abound, grace abounds even more. Looking back at Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, when he ate from the tree that was in the middle of the garden, that led to the consequence that God had warned him about. He said that in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And his death then spread to all men. Death reigned through that one man, Adam. And it was an immediate death of spiritual separation from God, as well as a physical death, a physical dying that he would eventually succumb to. And notice that it means all men are condemned, that is all of mankind, to such death because we were made sinners, even though it was Adam who trespassed and it was Adam who was disobedient. And then when the law came, the law came in, Paul says, to increase the trespass. In other words, it didn't make Adam's sin any less severe. Now, Paul had said earlier, if you remember in our text, that the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. In other words, having the law what that simply does is it expressly condemns a behavior. It confirms, basically, that what you have done is indeed sinful. Without the law, you wouldn't have known it. But having the law, then, doesn't make your sinfulness any less severe. It just heightens it, makes you aware of that what you have done is actually sinful. So between Adam and Moses, sin is not counted where there is no law, Paul had said, but when the law did come, man's sin was exposed. It wasn't diminished in any way. And so, as he says here, the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now, make no mistake, it doesn't mean that the law was what brought death. It's clear here and also when, and when Paul gets to chapter 7 that what brings death is the sin itself. The law was good. But what the law couldn't do was bring us back to life. And that's bad news. 
You know, it's bad news for the Jew who is hoping that by obedience to the law, he can be righteous. By being circumcised as a sign of the covenant and by being obedient to everything that God has commanded, he can somehow attain his righteousness. Well, he can't because you can't be made righteous through the law. And for those of you who aren't Jews, those of you who are Gentiles, you might want to plead innocence. I never had the law. How was I supposed to know it was sinful? But you discover then, when God tells you that what you have done is sinful, that it's been sinful all along. And we are still under God's condemnation. But the good news, the good news is that God's grace makes this righteousness a free gift available to Jew and Gentile alike. Whether you're Jewish or Gentile, despite your sin and trespasses, even though sins may have increased by the law, grace abounded all the more. And so God's abundant grace is shown to us in Christ Jesus. But as you're probably about to remember, uh, realize here is that that grace must also be received. Any gift that is offered to you isn't yours until you receive it. And righteousness is a free gift given to us by Jesus Christ or through Jesus Christ. And that is a gift that has to be received for us to enjoy it. When he says that Christ's one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men, that does not mean that all of mankind is now justified because Jesus has already died on the cross. Throughout everything we've just been reading in Romans, our justification comes by faith. So what does Paul mean by all men here? If he says, it, 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 he says all men are justified, if you look at the context, he's saying that it's the same whether you're Jew or non-Jew. All are saved in the same way by receiving this free gift of righteousness, which has to be received by faith. And again, he emphasizes the plurality of the fact. Many were made sinners so that by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Verse 19. And God has made his abundant grace clearly evident in the suffering of his son, Jesus Christ, who suffered the condemnation not for his sins, but ours, so that his righteousness may be received as a free gift by all who believe. And that righteousness you and I can receive through Jesus Christ is what leads us to eternal life. Now, why would anyone say no to such a gift? I mean, I realize I'm speaking to those here today who you're probably here because you've said yes to that gift. And you're worshiping Christ today because you are saved and praise God for that. So why would anyone say no? Well, perhaps there are some who would insist on their own righteousness. Perhaps you've heard them say, well, I've done a lot of good things in my life. I'm sure God will overlook all of the bad. Or there's some who might deny that they've sinned at all, so they don't need such a gift. I'm not guilty of anything too terribly bad. What I've done doesn't deserve condemnation from God. Or perhaps they might deny the existence of God and any standard that he might hold them up against in judgment. There's no God, so when I die, there's just nothing. And I'm nothing. Well, whatever they say that, they certainly don't have much confidence when they can say that, because what basis do they have that any of what they've said is true? If it is true that there really is nothing after this life, then this life is pointless. Then we die, and then that's it. And that leads nothing to nothing but despair of death. Or you and I can rely on the Word of God, the Word of God faithfully recorded, faithfully passed down through the ages, confirmed by prophecy and history, effective in inspiring people and transforming their behavior. It's been tested and proven. All of the attempts to er eradicate it have failed. And God's Word says this in chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, that He shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All of us who believe in Christ Jesus to save us, we no longer have sin reigning over us in death. Instead, as Paul says here, we have grace reigning over us, leading us to eternal life. And so here's where I believe that the life we live today is lived in the righteousness of Jesus Christ with the abundance of his grace to reign over us. And then as we fully appreciate that grace on our lives, then we begin to show that grace in at least these five ways when we show it to others. We live in the glorious presence 
of God's grace, which we will do in eternity. So awareness of and appreciation for God's abounding grace makes his grace more evident in your life and mine. What does grace reigning over you look like? What does grace reigning over me look like when I'm aware of and I appreciate God's abundant grace? Well, here we go. I believe for one of the things is that his grace makes me more compassionate. What I mean by compassionate is more able to sympathize with the weakness of others. Because when I realize what the scriptures is, is saying about me, I realize I was weak. I realized that I, had, I was unable to save myself from God's wrath. I may have thought that my good deeds were worthy of some kind of reward. I may have wanted to boast in some act of kindness or some sacrifice I made in my life someday. But when God reveals to me through his word, his purity, his holiness, his righteousness, then I realize I'm unclean, I'm undone. Even my righteous acts are like filthy rags, he says. I am truly a wretch that needs saving. I have nothing to offer my Savior. And when I realize I'm weak, then I'm so aware of and I'm so thankful for God's grace. And when I look at others and I see some of their faults, and I observe some of the behavior that God says is sinful, behavior that I know I too am guilty of, my first response will be compassion, not judgment. I know that sometimes I do set high expectations on others, but I have to admit that I've been weak in the same ways. Paul himself called himself the foremost of sinners because he was the one that blasphemed Christ. He persecuted his followers and he opposed them. He knew his own weakness. He knew that he was an apostle to one so great as Christ only because of the grace of Christ. And he knew it was foolish to boast in anything other than in his weakness. And so if I am ever not compassionate towards those who struggle to either let go of a sinful habit or those who still succumb to their flesh, then it's because I have forgotten how weak I truly am and how any good deeds that I may have done are only by God's grace. And it doesn't mean that I would regard sinful behavior as acceptable, but if I approach someone because I need to about their sinful behavior, then I do so as a weak person, equally in need of God's salvation and not as an authority who's appointed to point it out to them and condemn them. Now, there are some challenges sometimes to overcome my own pride. Any notion that perhaps God's grace was just to top up some righteousness that I already had, that's pride and that has to be suppressed in me. But I believe that if I truly appreciate God's grace, then I will be more compassionate and able to sympathize with weakness. Secondly, I also believe that I will be a more merciful person, willing to forgive those who've wronged me. Because when I look at the scriptures, what it tells me about my sin is it says I was guilty of sin and guilty of rebellion. My actions were indeed offensive to God. Now, I know that at times I might want to try to justify my actions, maybe excuse them, maybe say that they're not as bad as everyone else's actions have been, not as terrible as someone else's. But Paul writes to us, perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But the reality is Christ died for us and was willing to die for me while I was a sinful, ungodly person. And that's why I'm so much more aware of and thankful for his grace. So if someone ever has wronged me or sinned against me, I have a choice either to forgive that person or to bear that grudge and remain bitter. Sure, maybe in my anger or in my pain that I've suffered, maybe I'd want to hold that offense against them. Maybe I want to keep in mind their unfair treatment or require them to compensate me or restore in some way. As Yancey also says in his book, What's so amazing about grace? He says, when I feel wronged, I can contrive a hundred reasons against forgiveness. He needs to learn a lesson. I don't want to encourage irresponsible behavior. I'll let her stew for a while. It will do her good. She needs to learn that actions have consequences. I was the wronged party. It's not up to me to make the first move. How can I forgive if he's not even sorry? <laughs> Anyone ever had those thoughts? I marshal my arguments, Yancey says, until something happens 
to wear down my resistance. And grace, I believe, inspired by the grace that God showed me, helps me to choose to forgive. After all, as a believer in Christ, I'm one who has been forgiven much because of God's grace. And I realize that whatever I have to forgive of an offense against someone else is nowhere near the offense of my sin against God. The sacrifice I have to make to let that debt go is nothing compared to what Christ had to offer on the cross. And as C.S. Lewis puts it, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Any bitterness I wish to have or any ungrace only hurts me, but thankfully God's grace enables me to let it go. Yes, it may be challenging because I have some self-righteousness of my own, but then grace, God's grace overcomes it. Also, being more aware of God's grace and appreciating it more makes me more a, a more grateful person. Simply to be thankful in the circumstances that I happen to be in, whatever they may be. Because I know from the scriptures that I deserve condemnation. And instead, God gave me eternal life. I have a home in heaven that's been secured for me that's based on nothing that I have ever done. I can be thankful for that. So if I may be discontent with my appearance or my abilities as I compare myself to others, maybe with my circumstances as I see what other people are enjoying, maybe with my level of, of living space, I see the luxuries others live with. But when I think about God's gift of eternal life, the joy and the pleasure that awaits me in heaven one day, a joy that can never be taken away, if I think about my past and the sins that I've committed against God, against what I'm going to receive, if I think about the cross that Christ bore on my play, in my place because he loved me, and when I consider how undeserving I am of the home in heaven that he has prepared for me, then I have reason every single day to be thankful. And so as I'm aware of God's grace, I become a more thankful person. I know that the temptation is to dwell on this life, and to look at our circumstances here, and maybe if we wave our hands, the lights will come on. <laughs> Needs to miss some movement. But I need to think less of this life and more of the next. And to move from discontentment to gratitude. And I know it's easy to succumb to materialism. It may be challenging to overcome the envy, but then I remember one day, I will see God in his glory. And it had nothing to do with me guaranteeing my own place in heaven. Fourthly, if I dwell on God's grace shown to me, then I believe I can also become a more generous person. And what I mean by that is simply kinder, more hospitable, more giving. Because I know that my sins were many. His grace, however, was greater than all of them. And perhaps you know this too, because kindness isn't so difficult if it's someone who's been kind to you, right? Being hospitable to someone isn't as difficult when they've been hospitable with you. Giving something away is easy if it's nothing that we actually treasure. We're happy to just get rid of it anyway. It's just cluttering our place. But to be kind to someone who's been offensive or aggressive to us, to show hospitality to a stranger, to give something away that we might actually need, that requires something extraordinary and that requires us to remember how generous that God has been with us when we were undeserving the kindness the goodness shown to us how much he was willing to sacrifice of his own son what sacrifice do I have to make to be generous to someone else and show them some kindness or hospitality or give them a gift. How does what I have to sacrifice compare with God's gift to me? What price must I pay for compared to with a sacrifice that Christ made? So I believe that a greater appreciation for his generosity will inspire in me a willingness to make those sacrifices. And fifth and lastly, at least for today, I believe also that when I focus on or appreciate God's grace, that I will become a more serving person. Someone who willingly, humbly, humbly and willingly serves others, especially the body of Christ. 
See the good news that I've been forgiven of my sins and given the righteousness of Christ and now reconciled to God means that his spirit dwells in me. And his spirit in me gives me great encouragement and comfort. And Paul writes to the Philippians, if you have comfort in Christ, any, or any encouragement in Christ and any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So in other words, my awareness and appreciation of God's grace inspires in me a humble attitude of being a servant like my Savior is. I live in the service of others, and in Romans chapter 12, we're taught to serve the body of Christ. Do you realize that the gifts we've been given that we call spiritual gifts, the word for spiritual gift in the Bible is the same root word as grace. These are grace gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit. And what does he tell us to do with these grace gifts? That they are to be used for the building up of the body, not for ourselves. They are to be used in the service of others. And they're given for the common good. So God's grace in our life shows up as a willingness to serve, to serve in building up the body of Christ with each part doing as they've been gifted to do. And that's why we're also hoping that you'll receive encouragement over the next few weeks as you hear about the different ministry teams that are available for you to serve in, that you will also sense that God is asking me to serve in this capacity. And yes, it may be difficult. I know it's difficult for me sometimes to overcome a desire to be served rather than to serve. But then I'm reminded from Mark chapter 10, verse 45, that my Savior came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. And whatever impact I may have should be a non-issue. Whatever, uh, how, much, how menial the task may be, I should be just as willing to serve the body of Christ. So as I conclude, the gospel of Jesus Christ that we've been looking at in the book of Romans is a constant reminder that you and I were weak and sinful and ungodly, but though our sins were many, God's grace abounded even more. And so the life that we live today should really be putting on display God's grace in at least these five areas and being more compassionate, being merciful, being generous, being grateful, and being a servant. We live a life through faith in Jesus Christ where grace reigns and leads us to eternal life. So where else can we find in the world grace? If people are looking for mercy for a sinner, compassion for the poor, encouragement for the oppressed, I pray they will look at the church. I pray they will look at you and me. They'll look at this church. And according to Yancey, Dwight L. Moody is credited as saying, if one out of 100 men, one will read the Bible, the 99 will read the Christian. So what will they read in you and in me and in our community? would they see God's abounding grace? Let's pray. We thank you, Lord God, for the truth of your word and how it exposes to us our sinfulness and also how deserving we are of your wrath. But Lord, what a wonderful, wonderful gospel we have as well. Your abounding grace shown to us. And I pray, Lord God, that today, since we've been focusing on it, that you would see much fruit from today's worship service where we have focused on your abundant grace. And I pray, Lord, that you will find in us people who are more generous and compassionate and serving, people who are more merciful. Lord, for your glory, in Christ's name we pray, amen.